Hey class, this is your number eight day weekly drawing. Um, it's called Hopeless by Roy Lichtenstein. It's from 1963. It's an oil painting on canvas, which makes it in a way even more interesting because it looks like he um, did it in the same way that the comic was made because of all the dot work, which are called Bende dots. A device that was created for printmaking, um, which comics are made by printing presses. They use the dot to create tone without having to use full full tones in every spot to show white through. You can see the dot type of work in here. There's a little bit of white between all these pink and blue. Pretty interesting. Um, when you look at it, at first, glance, you probably see something that reminds you of a particular era in comics. It has the strong line work like a brush of ink around the different places, like the ink work of comics, and then the dots, and then the graphic style of it. Hopeless is derived from a panel from Run for Love in Secret Hearts, number 83 from November 1962. It's a DC comic. So he did this about a year later. So it's actually a panel that he appropriated, which means took in art terms, from a comic book. Now, it's in a collection of the Kunstmuseum Basel, which is in Switzerland. So it's this is a well-regarded work um, by an American pop artist, and pop was a pretty interesting art movement. Um, the people who worked in it, you know, most famously probably Andy Warhol. And um, during the late 1950s and early 1960s, a number of American painters began to adapt the imagery and motifs, adopt, I should say, not adapt, the imagery and motifs of comic strips. So Lichtenstein is one of those, and in 1958 he made drawings of comic strip characters. And during this time Andy Warhol produced his earliest paintings in the style of pop in 1960s. Um, Lichtenstein was actually unaware of Warhol's work, and that makes it kind of interesting that they were working simultaneously in a way working with similar ideas of um, popular culture coming into seeping into fine art. And then in the early 1960s, Lichtenstein produced several of these, what are called the fantasy drama in quotes, paintings of women in love affairs with unseen characters, but they would have been seen in the actual original comics of domineering men causing them to be miserable such as this one, Drowning Girl, um, is one of the other famous ones. These works sort of served as a prelude to his 1964 paintings of innocence in a variety of emotional states. So he has a long-standing sort of depiction and relationship with uh, women in popular culture through comics. One could say maybe he has a bit of a misogynistic idea here. Um, it's interesting that he picked this type of common, this kind of subject matter, matter. They say it was possibly influenced on his emphasis of depicting um, distressed women because in this time period, his first marriage was dissolving, so he was getting a divorce and his marriage was breaking up and not going well in his personal life, so you could say maybe there's some misogyny, which is kind of a negative, negative hatred of women type of attitude, but you could also say possibly he's actually more doing it because he is um, dealing with this personal issue and maybe feeling and trying to use art to deal with how he feels about his wife. Um, 
His first marriage was to Isabel Wilson, and he had two sons. It was from 1949 to 1965, so this is right towards the end of his marriage. And it was a long marriage, so maybe he's feeling like all the tension of that and the breakup and his kids and all of it kind of going badly. So then it starts to become less of a commentary um, about, you know, misogyny. And there's definitely a feminist critique of this work, but it starts to become more about his own personal turmoil um, and why he would use these these kind of comic images of girls with speech balloons. There's other ones, um, but they all, some of them have speech balloons, a lot of them have these thought balloons. That's the way it should have begun, but it's hopeless. It's um, nonetheless interesting work in terms of pop because I think it's particularly interesting because a lot of the other famous pop pieces don't have so much emotional concern. Um, if you think about Andy Warhol's soup cans and his Brillo pads and different things like that, there's almost an emptying out of emotion and a pure like, critique of the mass production. This continues on with that because of the style and the reference and the actual appropriation of a comic, but it adds in some emotional content that is often missing from Warhol. Maybe you could argue the most emotional of Warhol's works are the Marilyn Monroe pieces because it becomes sort of a conversation about the way in which a person was turned into an icon and their humanity was stripped away. But it's hard to kind of go down that path of believing him in that way because he operated a factory in such a way. His art was called the factory, a group of collaborators that were pretty much okay with dehumanizing people. And you could see that reflected in some movies that have been made, like Factory Girl, which has quite a lot of basis on actual events. So this guy is taking the same material, you know, um, mass-produced pulp fiction comic books, not soup cans, but still a similar pop cultural pervasive type of thing, and using it to talk about something that's more personal, albeit the imagery is a bit impersonal in the sense that many people could own it. This produces an interesting conversation, though, between this work, the people who may have seen it in the original form as a DC comic, and then however people would see it out of its context, stripped out, appropriated into a new context, which is the gallery and museum context, a white-walled sort of clean, pristine, high art conversation, which does multiple things at once, talks about the original, talks about mass production, talks about the sort of divide that is often created between popular culture and the fine art, highfalutin culture that people have critiqued in many ways. And then also the appropriation of imagery, like making taking something that you didn't really make and making it your own. And then that kind of talks about the identification this artist had with the piece. So there's, albeit it seems simplistic in a way, there's a lot of interesting things going on here. He did make some modifications to the original source material, um, using more vibrant colors and bold and wavy lines to intensify the emotion of the scene. So he's purposely changing it a bit um, to add that emotion. So that's further in that argument of he's interested in the emotional content. This work is considered a significant advancement in Lichtenstein's form, color, composition, and the overall power of image in his work. So it's a really good work for us to talk about the design. In works like this, he derived enduring art from a fleeting form of entertainment, basically, which we've been talking about. And... He did remain fairly true to the source material. So this sort of part of a comic is a little bit atypical for the era in that it's very melodramatic. So he did also purposely pick 
a piece that was more emotional. So beside, we talked about the line quality, right, through paint. And it, he matched the feeling of ink brushwork. If you've ever done brushwork with ink, it feels like this. These are the type of lines you can get. He used a very simple but bold color palette. The basics of it are, um, besides the neutral of the face, the white and black, he's using some form of red, yellow, and blue, which are the primary colors, right, in different spots. This is basically a form of red, a little bit on the pink side. This is a neutral, it's pinkish, but very neutral, almost coming into the beige-ish, but nonetheless a form of red. And he does it if you see... Let's draw on this real quick. Here, let me get the drawing tool up. He does it in a way that's interesting because he's using almost like a rule of thirds in a way, which we haven't really talked about. Oops, let's erase that. A rule of thirds is a way people talk about design being interesting. He kind of breaks it up diagonally into three main sections, and then he uses other elements to kind of mess with it. But overall, you can kind of see, and he has a strong diagonals, but he doesn't let our eye go out very much in the movement, because right here where I could go out, he picks it back up again here. Um, it's sort of a what you would call a bleed in the sense of comics. It goes all the way to the edge. When he goes all the way to, to the edge of the canvas, which is common in painting, but he chops off a bit of the head, which makes it more interesting in a way because we feel the sense of motion. The eyes are pretty much, in a way, the focal point, um, almost in the center, not quite a little off, which gives us a feeling of motion, sort of her falling down or throwing herself a tiny bit. The blue is interesting because it, it keeps our eye moving, pun there with the eyes between her eyes and then the bottom area where she's supposedly on a blanket something like that maybe but it also um gives us the sense of the water wateriness of tears right like she could be in a puddle of tears the tears are white though so there's kind of an in-between like are these the tears on a surface he uses white to kind of give that glistening idea and then there's a repetition of things like white Everything about the way he does it leads our eye back into these sections of the face, right? There's kind of things that go up and down. So the focus becomes that even though the words are the initial thing we see, because they're at the top, they're strong, and we want to read words, he uses the comic devices to keep us thinking about the emotion and the context here, doing things to draw us into it and spend some time with it. Um, the bright colors really grab us, and the form and con context of it um, taken away, but we still get the emotion because of the image that he used, right? And the form helps us with that. The way he uses color and brushwork and the density of line, eyebrows, things like that, they kind of bleed together in interesting ways. So it ends up being flat. But the proportions are, albeit this is very stylized, stylized meaning everything becoming very geometric, the proportions are fairly accurate to a face, albeit the eyes are bigger and more uh, intensified and drawn attention to by the way that the size that they are. The ear is a bit off, but that's typical of the, you know, the face, the mouth feels like it's floating on the face. All these things are typical of comics, though. So. The hand is a bit bigger than it would be. It's closer, so it's foreshortening a little bit right here, where it's coming at the picture plane. Um, but it has a naturalism to it, stylized naturalism. We know what he's depicting. We have a strong sensibility. It's a very graphic image. We can read it very quickly. It has a good design that lets us have a chance to then kind of contemplate some of the emotional qualities he's trying to draw out. Or maybe dismiss it as um, a cheating type of art where he's just making something that was already there. Either way, it becomes interesting because we have to deal with it as a viewer. So it's a pretty good piece. And I think um, looking at this piece, 
as something to draw versus, you know, like the last weeks that we've been looking at other very different things. So it, it gives us a good chance to deal with something new in a different style and way of working, right? As compared to some of our past things like durs, prints, and stuff like that. So I'm interested in looking at all types of fine art as a way of thinking about design. Um, and I think you should be too when you're looking and thinking about design. There's a lot of different different art movements that have things to learn and glean glean from. So hope you guys enjoyed drawing this. Think about using thicker line medium. Maybe you could um, use ink even if you wanted to on this to try it out. It'd be a good thing to try to emulate. Um, think about drawing it like he drew it. I've talked to you about this before, but you know when you're doing lines, when you're making something, when you're emulating it, if you think about how someone made it, like you can tell in the sort of detail of how it was made. Um, what do I mean? You're looking at this like an investigator and seeing how line work is happening, like it's thin to thick. Then that means he started the brush or whatever here and went down that way. The original inking artist did at least. He built it up in thicker paint, but still, if you kind of try to work in the same way, then it will help you. It'll help you learn this methodology that the person used. First, get accurate line drawing, and then you can try to do some tone. If you want to color this, that's fine too. I'm not suggesting that you have necessarily the time to do that, but some people get into it and it's interesting to them, so that's fine too. All right, take care, guys. I'll uh, talk to you soon.